uh, first of all, I can't say uh, how pleased I am uh, to be here. I, I could not uh, say enough about that. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Zubrin and everybody at the Mars Society for the incredible work and putting this together. I'm really proud that uh, I was kind of the initiator of bringing this uh, convention here to uh, ASU. Uh, some of you might know that I hosted uh, the Mars Society a few years ago at USC when I taught there, um, and I am just uh, so excited to be doing that again. Um, this morning's lineup, incredible. Uh, honored to be on the uh, the podium here uh, with the people that are uh, that are going to follow me. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about mentioning the people that are going to be here later is, is that uh, space policy is generally nonpartisan, right? Um, this is a photo uh, from a few months ago in my classroom, right? And you've got, if you know who these people are, uh, Dr. Scott Pace, who's basically the, the top Trump's policymaker in space, uh, with uh, General Charlie Bolden, uh, who was President Obama's uh, NASA administrator, basically the top space person in that administration. Uh, and you know what? They like each other, right? And and they spent uh, about two hours riffing in my classroom with my students. So if you guys want to be uh, future space leaders and have the best network ever, I suggest you sign up for my program. But the point is that um, this is not like other governmental domains. Uh, a couple months ago at the... Uh, First Artemis launch attempt, I hosted a uh, panel of uh, the Thunderbird School of Global Management, ASU did at Kennedy Space Center. And again, you see a bipartisan uh, group there. You've got myself and General Bolden again, uh, Jim Bridenstine, uh, Trump's NASA administrator, and Bahavi Alal, uh, who we'll be hearing from shortly, who led the uh, Biden uh, transition team for, uh, for NASA and other agencies, and who is uh, an amazing uh, expert on nuclear propulsion and power and uh, the acting chief technologist at NASA, Mike Gold. Uh, Gabe Sherman and, and Scott's up on the screen again, right? But what really impressed me is look at the end of this, right? Could you imagine any other uh, agency in the United States government where you would have the Trump, Obama, and, and Biden team up smiling together like that and hugging each other, it would not happen. So I'd like you to give yourself a round of applause for being part of the space community, the most functional part of the United States. <laughs> All right. okay. We may agree about it, disagree about a lot of other things, and I can be brutal on Twitter about economic policy or social issues, but when it comes to, to space, uh, you know, we're all moving forward together. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out that I'm particularly uh, pleased with the current administration's effort was the uh, intent to uh, ban anti-satellite weapon tests that are that are destructive. This is something that makes total sense. We're not giving up anything here, folks, because we wouldn't do this anyway. We're not going to go up and create a mess. This does not prevent the United States from developing technologies and testing things non-destructively, but we're not going to go make a, a mess on orbit again. Uh, and by taking the moral high ground, we've encouraged other countries to follow suit. Uh, and uh, uh, President, Vice President Harris's announcement has been followed by announcements from the UK and South Korea. Eventually we'll get China and Russia on board, hopefully with, with good behavior in space, because we've got to have that if we want to go forward. Um, now back to Mars. I had a long, long list of the best ways to get to Mars. Well, actually that's it, okay? Uh, if you if all you really want to do is just get people on Mars uh, and you're not dealing with a bunch of other issues, this is how you do it. And, and, and Bob has nailed it and he's been talking about it for years. And I completely agree with him that other methods may be less efficient to achieve this goal. That said, if you were at USC uh, a few years ago, how many people were there at that event? Okay, I, I had the joy of debating Bob Zubrin, which, you know, he has no filter and he's brilliant. And uh, it's, uh, it's you know, a challenge in front of his people, right? And, and I supported the, the Lunar Gateway, which he despises. Uh, but but let's talk about how things actually work and, and why the, they are the way that they are. First of all, you can only do things that are technically possible, okay? Engineering matters. The laws of physics are not exactly flexible. Uh, and so if you have ideas that don't comport with uh, with engineering possibilities or the laws of physics as we understand them, they're probably not going to happen. Uh, I, I do get countless emails from people that want to talk to me about their perpetual motion machines and their anti-gravity systems and their uh, reactionless uh, thrusters and all that. Uh, keep sending them, you know, I, I hope someday you're right. But uh, things also, though, have to be economically possible. 
if there isn't enough money in the world to pay for it, we can't do it. So terraforming Mars, probably not happening anytime soon because of, of this issue. We're going to have to find some, some new ways to think about that. Uh, I do think it will happen, uh, not in my lifetime. They've got to be politically possible, okay? So you can't do things that... Uh, that irritate your government or sometimes the governments of other countries. And there are a lot of things we'd like to do that fall in that domain. But what you end up with is this little nexus in this Venn diagram. This is things that are actually the realm of possible space policies and plans. And a lot of us have ideas that fall into the, the outside categories. We've got to deal with, as Jim Bell said yesterday, uh, the mission that we have. So in my opinion, this will never happen. The big government flags and footprint program to the moon that looks a lot like Apollo on steroids. Sadly, no, uh, it won't get funded. The Artemis program to the moon, the GAO now estimates it, I think $93 billion, but let's just say $100 billion. And we all know it's gonna cost more than that, right? Uh, Luckily, I'm not actually the CFO of NASA right now. I was nominated to do that. If I was, I wouldn't be able to tell you uh, that that's not <laughs> you know, the way things work. Um, the, the ARIES program uh, from the Martian, and I've talked to a lot of people who know, who, who won't be quoted, but $200 billion to $400 billion. That money is not coming out of the United States' uh, budget. We've got to find another way to, to do this, okay? Uh, we had this thing called Journey to Mars at NASA, right? The, the squid chart. Uh, and it was just a graphic. Nobody was developing a lander or an ascent vehicle uh, to implement that program. Nobody really believed it was ever going to happen. We just talked about it because they darn well knew that Congress wouldn't pay for it, right? So they worked on other things and they're good people and they worked on other things that were good, frankly. Uh, but they had to keep talking about it uh, to keep the public happy. Now, it should happen because the public wants it, as we've discussed, but we're constrained by the NASA allocation of $25 billion. It's less than one half of 1% uh, of the federal budget. Uh, in 1991, when uh, George Bush Sr. left office, it was about 1%. And as we know, during the Apollo program, it was as much as 5%, but that is never, ever happening again because of the unconstrained growth of entitlement programs like Medicare eating up the federal budget. It's just the reality. The DOD space budget, uh, I'm not allowed to tell you what it is. I'll have to kill you, uh, but you know. Um, the F-35 cost overrun, to put this in context, and I'm not talking about the airplanes, I'm talking about the, the overrun, the part that they, they didn't know about or lied about or something, $180 billion, okay? So that is, like seven times the NASA budget, right? And it's it's five times uh, everything that we spend in space. Medicare fraud, waste, and abuse. This is not uh, providing medicine to keep uh, old people uh, spry and golfing forever, right? Or driving the RVs around the desert. This is the money that's being stolen, $80 billion. The, the money the government knows is being stolen. Who knows how much is really being stolen? But this is three times bigger than the NASA budget, right? And growing, okay? This is where your tax dollars are going to go, like it or not. We do get benefits from space. I need you to talk about this whenever you get a chance to speak to a public representative or the media or anybody who cares. One of my favorite examples is the savings from global positioning system, according to a Motorola study for just the US trucking fleet. Nothing but the trucking fleet. $52 billion a year. Our entire space budget is basically returned to us in the improvements and efficiencies in our trucking fleet, okay? Not to mention Uber and, and Pokemon Go. Is that still a thing? <laughs> okay. If NASA canceled the SOS Orion uh, program, the agency would have plenty of money to do Mars Direct with Starship. Who believes that? Raise your hand. Is that true? Okay. So who says that's false? The rest of you are bloody cowards, okay? Um, I know this is a popular sentiment uh, uh, here sometimes, uh, but let's talk again about how things actually work. So Congress decides how NASA gets to spend its money and they appropriate money, the, the O and B uh, apportions to the agency. So Congress says, we want you to do this. You will build this heavy lift rocket, you will do it at this center because uh, there are jobs in state X, uh, and you will do these science experiments 
because there are jobs in state Y and everybody kind of wrangles over this in a dark room and, and we give the, the NASA budget. Now I wanna be clear, these are mostly good people who are passionate, care about the future of America mm -hmm. and about our space program, but they're also elected by people in their state to go do things that those people want to have happen and they do a good job and I don't blame them for doing that. Now, OMB, on the other hand, decides whether NASA is really, really, really going to get the money to do what it is that Congress told them to do. And unfortunately, in space, OMB tends to act as though they're policymakers, not just a, an oversight organization. This is the Office of Management and Budget. Now, at the agency, you've got the Office of the CFO, and you've got the administrators, and they can allocate these monies to the various programs in keeping with the laws that Congress uh, drafted which if you really want to go to sleep someday, I suggest you go look at some of these NASA budgets and, uh, and appropriations. But let's just say that Senator Administrator Nelson decided that he wanted to, uh, to move money from one program to another. Uh, we would call that a, a programmatic transfer. No problem. Well, it is the problem that NASA is not run like some other business where the CEO of the business just goes, tells the, the CFO that we're going to move money to one program to another. No, 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 no. Congress has built in something called a not to exceed limitation into all of the funding. And guess how much money the not to exceed limitation is in most cases for NASA? Anybody know? Close to that. If, uh, it's in the hundreds of thousands, like 500,000 is the number I often often see in these bills. Yeah, hundreds of thousands. You cannot buy a friggin' condo in Washington, D.C. for the amount of money that Administrator Nelson is allowed to actually make decisions on. So no, you may not go cancel the James Webb Taste Telescope because it cost a bunch of money and just go stick that into a, a Mars sample return or something you love. Can't be done, okay? So we have to live in the real world. Now, in the real world, we can't afford to get Congress to give us $400 billion to go to Mars. So I would suggest we apply the 80-20 rule. And 20% of the, the money uh, for uh, the Ares Mars mission is sending Mark Watney to Mars. 80% is the bringing him home part. So my opinion is don't bring him home, okay? All right. We are perfectly capable of putting something the size of a minivan on, on Mars, which means we can put an astronaut or two and uh, enough uh, material to keep them alive for long enough to determine if there's life on Mars, you know, a few months, and, uh, and then we're done, okay? Um, Congress is not going to prove that, but the day they do, I'll sign up, okay? I'm just curious how many of you would sign up? All right, yeah, so they, there's no problem getting qualified people to do that mission. Good luck selling it. Uh, but the other op opportunity is focusing on uh, creating a permanent settlement rather than building the crazy Mars descent vehicle and getting it to work, right? And I know that if you're a theoretical armchair engineer that, you know, building the Mars descent vehicle and giving, oh, I'm just going to use in resource utilization and make some methane and pump it. No, you've got to make the methane. You've got to do that with an automated system that you can't touch when it breaks down. You've got to compress this stuff, which takes a bunch of energy, keep it uh, cryogenic and load it into this rocket. We can't even get the SLS off the ground because we have leaks in the fueling system all the time. How are we going to do that? millions of miles away where we can't just, this is hard, okay? This is really hard. So I say skip the ascent vehicle. Uh, now, where does the money uh, in space come from? It's really important to see that 60% of it is the United States government. I think Jim Bell mentioned yesterday, the US government spends more money on space than everybody else combined. And I'm happy we do. It has paid massive dividends to us. The reason you're sitting here, uh, with lots of cool technology has to do with uh, externalities generated by this investment over the last 70 years, right? I wouldn't have solar panels on my roof and uh, two electric cars being charged and all these cool things if we didn't do this, okay? Now, you might think the Russians are number two. Nope, 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 nope. They're actually pretty irrelevant and shrinking. Look at that, 2.7%. Uh, in fact, the Japanese spend more than they do. The Europeans spend a lot more than they do. The Chinese are moving up. Now, is that concerning and, and frightening that the Chinese are moving up? Well, we'll have to think about that. In my opinion, first of all, competition is good and cooperation is boring, okay? So in 1957, the Soviets did this and oh my God, the Soviets have launched an artificial moon and they're gonna drop nukes on us and they're gonna spy on us. And 
panic, panic in the streets, good. 13 years later, I mean, look at that stupid steel ball. And 13 years later, we still have this iconic photo, which most people think looks high tech today, right? On the other hand, we decided to get together in 1974. We had Apollo Soyuz. We did the famous handshake in space, Kumbaya, right? And I know there's a lot of people who think that if uh, we did a United Nations space program and everybody worked together on just one program, it would be far more efficient. Well, how does working together work? 25 years later, we had something that looked a lot like that, okay? And it still had a damn Soyuz attached to it, right? 22 years later, we got a bigger thing that looks kind of like that in the same orbit, right? Same altitude, same inclination. And it has a Soyuz attached to it, right? Okay, finally, we're moving beyond the Soyuz, I think. But the fact of the matter is, I love ISS. We, we've done a lot of amazing things there, but we haven't done anything bold and amazing because there wasn't any conflict. Conflict is good when we don't actually shoot at each other. World War II gave us amazing things. I would never recommend a World War II, but you know, you got jet travel, you got nuclear power, you got microwave ovens, I, I could go on. Uh, a competitive space program is a beautiful thing. So bless the Chinese, okay? Um, and I completely, absolutely agree with the, uh, Senator Administrator Nelson on this topic, that the Chinese are predatory uh, when it comes to territory. You look what they're doing. Uh, you know, on the earth and, and just figure out how that's going to work on the moon. And it isn't good. We need to be serious about this. And I am so glad that we are and that that is also bipartisan. Now, the thing I love the most, though, OK, and this is how we get to Mars, is look at the private investment. Ignore 2022. That that was just the first quarter on this chart. So that, that's not the whole year. Uh, but we're up about $50 billion a year now in, in private investment into space, which is pretty much the same as the U.S. government invest into space. That is a beautiful thing. And that is what we need to leverage. And so we need to do it in a way that makes sense. And unfortunately, going and building a Mars program today, unless uh, you're Elon Musk and just personally passionate about it, is not a business model. So how do we get to a business model? Well, you look at some of these companies that are, that are raising funds and they realize, yes, someday they want to go to Mars and 3D print a rocket. Uh, bless Tim and Jordan. They were students uh, that I am proud to have worked with at USC uh, since uh, since the beginning. But they also realize that they've got to do things one step at a time, and they've got to have customers for their rocket for for Leo work, and they want to go to the moon because they know that that's achievable in a reasonable amount of time. Now, Leo commercialization is totally real, and this this brought it home to me. I, you know, I've always been talking about it for twenty years. But I was literally flying on an airplane from Miami uh, to uh, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, I looked out the window as we passed over KSC at about 22 miles away, just uh, outside the limit uh, for a, a launch day, actually. And I was looking for the SLS out on the pad at, at 39B. And you could actually see the VAB and the path out to the pad here. And I could see the SLS. This is an iPhone photo, mind you, right? Uh, but there's that little squiggle at the top. What is that? I honestly saw the Axiom 1 launch just happen out the window of my plane as I'm driving by. And there's a human commercial space launch going on as I happen to fly by. I took this photo again with my iPhone, right? And I looked over at my neighbor in the plane seat. I go say, hey, there's my, my friend Mike going to space. <laughs> How cool is that, right? <laughs> Not only do I see this commercial rocket going to space, I, I know the people on it, right? Amazing. A uh, cislunar commercial is actually emerging and there are things that we can do there that will return value to earth in a reasonable period of time that can close a business case for private investment so that's happening nasa is supporting that i think that what uh, smd did uh, uh under thomas subrek and with uh, the clips program supporting artemis is a super good example of getting the robots and people working together on the same mission so in my opinion nasa's moon to mars makes sense uh, one thing I want them to do, though, is clarify their position on the moon. It's got to be permanent and sustainable. I'm so excited that I was part of the team that sat down and looked at NASA's capabilities and said, what do we do with these rockets and capsules and stuff? You know, let's go to the moon. It's something we needed to, to do again, and we need to do it right this time, which means permanent and sustainable. And we decided we were going to send a woman to the moon, which, of course, is why it got named... Uh, Artemis, and that's great. And the Biden administration's expanded that to include a person of color. We need 
everybody on board in space if we want support. So that's all good. But let's not send a woman and a person of color to just do something some white guys did 70 years ago or 50 years ago. Let's give them something important to actually do historically, which is establish the permanent and sustainable presence on another world that gives us the capabilities to learn the things we need to learn in order to do Mars right. This includes developing better uh, environmental control and life support systems, better spacesuits, figuring out the food and consumables when we're only three days or a week away from uh, more food and consumables rather than, than doing it when we're months or years away. In situ resource utilization, it's not exactly the same on the moon but there are, uh, as it is on Mars, but there are a whole lot of parallels and we're gonna learn a lot there. Radiation, we don't know really how the human body reacts to long-term exposure outside the Van Allen boats. We can get this done and we can get it done in the next few years. Partial gravity, we got a ton of data on 1G, right? You know, you're all you're all data, right? Uh, we've got a really good amount of data on zero G from those years and years in, in Leo on the station, but we don't know anything about in between. Hopefully finding out what one six gravity does to your body and to the gestation of organisms. Let's take, let me recommend this to NASA. Bahavi, this is really important. Kittens. I want to send kittens to the moon, send a pregnant cat. Let's see how that gestation, yeah. if you have kitten videos on the moon, the NASA budget will be no problem, okay? Yeah. <laughs> But we need we need to know, right? Okay, we're going to do long distance operations at again a relatively safe rate and cryogenic refueling. Okay, people don't talk about this. I love the Starship uh, idea, and I'm glad that uh, that we're including it as uh, one of the vehicles for the human lander system. I strongly believe we need, need to have two because if we're going to send people who are not test pilots uh, to the moon, we need to be able to get them back. These are like regular human beings, scientists, artists, engineers. Uh, they need more than one way to come back. So it's good. But Starship has to be refueled on orbit 10 to 12 times before it can go and land on the moon, okay? We've never refueled anything cryogenically on orbit. This is a big task. I think SpaceX is going to have some cryo refueling blooper reels, right? Um, that we're going to learn this. And this is important. And NASA is helping fund it with, uh, with Artemis programs. So important. Um, I also want to talk about internationalism and, and program continuity. Yeah, the Kumbaya thing doesn't produce disruptive innovation and fast change, but it does often secure uh, the success of something. And one of the reasons ISS has never been canceled by a uh, change in Congress or uh, presidential administrations is because we don't want to piss off our, our European partners on this program or previously the Russians. The Russians have pissed us off now, so, you know. Uh, that's how that goes. Now, Gateway, same thing. Bob hates it, but it's an amazing opportunity for us to develop a lot of capabilities that we need to do in space and do it internationally and make sure that we bring our, our partners on board and they stick, right? Uh, now, of course, one of those partners is probably going away. Uh, now, I hope we see regime change in Moscow and, and they come back because I love the things Russians have done historically. I carry around a phone case with a picture of Yuri Gagarin on the back, uh, an oil painting I actually own. And, and so I'm really respectful of their heritage. But uh, right now, I don't think it makes sense uh, to, to plan on them being a dependable partner. So what do we do? Well, there's some other countries coming forward. I'd love to see ISRO get on board here, right? Uh, I was speaking in India a year ago, and I'm going back in, in, in January. And, you know, they had a real close relationship with the Russians. I'm like, you know, it's time to move on. You need to join Artemis Accords, right? So 22 nations have joined the Artemis Accords, something I'm really excited to, to see that started in the last administration has been aggressively carried forward by the current administration. Uh, I'm hoping you're going to see this country pop up next. Anybody know who that is? That's Ecuador. If that happens, I want you to know it's uh, because of a student of mine at Thunderbird, who uh, Robert Aon, who is... Uh, took me down to uh, Quito to meet with a bunch of government representatives and got Mike Gold talking to uh, the Ecuadorian ambassador to the US and they're excited about it. So look for that. Uh, and like I said, uh, if you wanna ever be part of the best and only accredited master's uh, degree in space management, uh, we would love to sign you up. Uh, we've got a table right out there. My colleague, Katie, Katie would be glad to help you. Uh, if I have a moment for questions, I will. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Greg W. Autry and I, I warn you, I can be Kind of like Bob Zubrin, uh, unfiltered. Hi, thank you so much. It was great, great talk. 
Um, I'm personally interested in like the legislative and policy side yeah. of space. What advice would you give to someone who's looking to make that a career? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for doing it. Um, I would join my program. Uh, but no, um, obviously, keep in touch and read all about it. And don't just read the news headlines. Dig in and read the actual uh, uh, laws that uh, that are passed, the bills that are proposed and don't pass. Uh, and go spend some time in, in D.C. Walk the halls of Congress. The way I actually got involved in this is I just cared about this issue, right? And I started researching it as a management scholar, academic, back in 2002. And by 2004, I began to see we needed to uh, enable commercial space in several ways. So I paid for my own dime to fly to D.C. and I would walk around the hallways of Longworth and Rayburn and knock on the doors. And a couple people answered the doors and brought me in. I became good friends, for instance, with Senator, I'm sorry, Congressman Dana Rohrabacher, who was on the SciTech committee and worked with him and Tony DeTora, his uh, legislative assistant. And, and actually, you know, they listened to my advice. Some of that went into things like Commercial Space Launch uh, Act amendments. Uh, I spoke to uh, people that I didn't agree or didn't agree with me as well, uh, but I began to understand why they were doing what they were doing, and uh, so important, so so engage. And 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 they're surprisingly open. Uh, and, you know, if you go ask for a meeting with a staffer uh, that does uh, space policy, they'll probably actually come talk uh, talk to you. Uh, and you should do that. And if you can't do it in person, uh, you know, try to do it remotely. Yes, sir. Or, I, I'm sorry, she's in charge of the microphone. Hello. Uh, just quick. Quickly, um, any thoughts about, uh, you know, the, the government did support a good bit of, you know, early aviation stuff. And, yeah. and Bob Zubrin mentioned that, you know, the possibility of maybe doing point-to-point -point rocket stuff. And I was wondering if that was a way maybe to expand congressional support for space itself. Yes, please. So one of the uh, roles I had until recently was I served on the Comstack the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee for FAA as an appointment from the Department of Transportation. And I was the chair of the Safety Working Group. We help advise FAA on potential future rulemaking uh, and on, uh, you know, how to promote and uh, uh, facilitate the industry, which is also part of their mandate, uh, and we should work on that, promote and facilitate. I'm going to tell you, I am concerned, and I have said so publicly, that FAA's current direction is all about regulation and safety, bless their hearts, because they are putting people who are in charge of airplanes into the space office, which before was all space people. Uh, I actually interviewed for the top job uh, at AST uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I didn't get it, but I can tell you that the, the committee of people that I went to go interview at FAA, there was nobody who knew anything about space on that committee, and they didn't care. All they wanted to talk about was the national airspace and how to keep rockets from interfering with it. We need to change that attitude. We need to own point-to-point -point travel, and if the FAA wants to stay relevant in the future, that's where it's at. We need to set standards that come from the United States the same way that the United States set the standards for air traffic management globally. You know, if a Russian pilot lands in Shenzhen, uh, he talks talks to the Chinese in English, right? And uses terminology that we put together. We want to be in that same position. All right, thank you. I'm glad to talk to anybody offline. You have an amazing group of people coming up.